Welcome back to Kid Missing TV. We're going to talk about another serial offender. That is the Freeway Phantom. It was a self-imposed nickname for an unidentified serial killer who was active in Washington, D.C. from April 1971 to September of 1972. He had at least six victims. Okay. Let me just tell you the names of the victims before we go any further. This is going to be easiest for me just to list the names. Um, everybody does it differently. Carol Denise Spinks, Darlenia Denise Johnson, Brenda Faye Crockett, Neomisha Yates, Nenemosha, Nenemosha Yates, sorry. Brenda Denise Woodard, Diane Denise Williams. Okay. Uh, Spinks was just 13. She was sent by her sister to buy groceries at the 7 Eleven. She was abducted on that walk, and her body was found um, six days later. Um, Darlenia Johnson was only 16 when she was abducted. On July 8th, Brenda Faye Crockett was only 10 years old. She was abducted when she went to the store for her mother. Neno... Nenemoshia Yates was only 12 years old when she was walking home around 7 p.m. from a Safeway store on October 1st, 1971, when she was kidnapped, raped, and strangled. Uh, Brenda Woodard was 18. She boarded a city bus after having dinner with a high school classmate, and six hours later, a policeman found her body. Okay. Uh, off of Route 202 in the Washington, Baltimore Washington Parkway. Unlike the other victim, she was still wearing her shoes and a coat had been placed over her chest. One of its pockets contained a note from the killer. It says, this is tantamount to my insensitivity, S-I-C, which means the spelling was wrong. Oh, no, it means they wrote it ex exactly the way it was written, bad spellings and all. To people, especially women, I will admit the others when you catch me, if you can, Freeway Phantom. Ah. Um, it had been dictated to her. It had been written on paper from her school notebook. It had been dictated to her by the killer. I have to show you this because it's how he had her write it. And it's, it's pretty bizarre. The Phantom's finally victim, final victim was claimed a year later on September 5th. A 17-year-old blue high school senior, Diane Williams, cooked dinner for her family, and then visited to her boyfriend's house. She was later seen boarding a bus at 11.20 p.m. near his house. A few hours later, her strangled body was discovered, dumped along I-295, just south of the district line. She, her shoes were missing and no sign of sexual assault. Wow. The FBI is involved in the case... Um, they believe that it was a um, somebody with a shoe fetish, which kind of makes sense. Um, they had a gang known as the Green Vega Rapists, and they were 
possible suspects. Uh, because one of the gang members initially implicated another gang member, and yeah, it didn't, I don't think it was them, it didn't turn out to be them. Um, Edward Selman and Tommy Simmons. Selman and Simmons were both former policemen who were arrested for the murder of a 14-year-old girl named Angela Denise Barnes. And at one point, she was thought to be a victim of the Phantom. Authorities later determined that Barnes was not a victim of the Freeway Phantom and resumed their investigation on the murders. Robert Askins... In March of 1977, a 58-year-old computer technician was charged with abducting and raping a 24-year-old woman inside his Washington, D.C. home. Homicide detective Lloyd Davis proceeded to question him and learned that he had been charged with murder on several previous occasions. So what the hell was he doing out? Oy, 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 oy. Anyway. Ah. Uh. It looks like the okay, one of the things that they noticed about this man, first of all, he, he was clearly a serial killer, was that um Wow, he was old. Uh, in 1938, when he was a 19-year-old student at Minor Teachers College, served cyanide-laced whiskey to five prostitutes at a brothel, resulting in the death of 31-year-old Ruth McDonald. On December 30th, only two days later, he stabbed to death another prostitute, 26-year-old Elizabeth Johnson, at the same location. Upon his arrest, Askins declared to the police that he was a woman hater and was placed under mental observation at Washington, D.C.'s Gallinger Hospital. While there, he broke free of his restraints and assaulted three orderlies with a chair before being subdued. During his trial, it was revealed he'd been a police informant aiding law enforcement in the arrest of prostitutes. In April 1939, Askins was found criminally insane and committed to St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Five months after being released in April 1952, he strangled 42-year-old Laura Cook to death. He was indicted for this murder in 1954, accused of several other assaults of similar circumstance, and retried for the 1938 murder. It having been determined, he was indeed sane upon committing the act. Despite claiming he in intended the cyanide for himself, planning suicide, he was convicted of second-degree murder, sentenced to 20 years to life. The conviction was overturned in 1958. After the 1978 rape charge, Askins' home was searched by police in connection with the Freeway Phantom murders. Court documents were found in a desk drawer in which a judge used the word tantamount, an uncommon word that had appeared in the note dictated by the killer of Brenda Woodard. Furthermore, colleagues at the National Science Foundation, where Askins was employed, reported that tantamount was a word that frequently cropped up in his speech. A search warrant was eventually obtained, and investigators dug through Askins' backyard. No physical evidence was obtained, and Askins was not charged in connection with the killings. And he died in federal prison in Cumberland, Maryland in 2010 at the age of 91. Well, I don't think he was the Freeway Phantom, and I'll tell you why. His victims were all middle-aged women, and they were prostitutes. They weren't children. These victims were all children, teenagers. He's looking for a pedophile slash a febophile, which is someone that likes teenagers. Um, in the Freeway Phantom case, that's what you're looking for. <coughs> so I think it barked up the wrong tree there, even though this dude was clearly 
a serial killer and never should have been let out in the first place. And it's infuriating to me that someone so evil could live to the age of 91. Yet I know wonderful people that barely live past their 60s. And it's like, okay, why such an evil person to live to 91 years old? It just isn't fair, you know? So, I don't have a phone number or anything in that case. Um... <clears throat> But you can probably call the DC Metropolitan Police. Thank you for joining me. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Please click like and subscribe. I feel like a broken record. <laughs> um, please comment. And I will see you next time for more of Murderous March. Bye.